Hello, my name is uh, Simon uh, Svalle Skogsrud and I am the CTO of Sanity.io. So my talk today is called Patterns for Freedom and I'm going to talk about the value of uh, improvisation and sustainable freedom in software development and in business in general, maybe also in life, uh, and how that motivates our work at uh, Sanity.io. So freedom, generally accepted as a good thing, being unencumbered by uh, commitments, doing whatever you want, whenever you want it. It's fantastic. It's like, woo. But of course, freedom has a dark side to it. If you only do what you want to do all the time and never what you should do, you get in trouble. You run out of money, you run out of stimulant substances, and your life is, uh, is a mess. Uh, so this is about freedom, having it, and being able to, to keep it. Uh, so that reminded me when I was thinking about that, reminded me of, of the age when we used jQuery. It's like a library for web development that was very popular in the past. And it's very powerful. You have huge freedom. You can do whatever you like. You can connect anything to anything and you can make all kinds of relationships uh, in your website, animations and interactions and uh, listeners and whatever. And of course, uh, it feels fantastic. You give, give, get this rush of freedom in the beginning. Uh, but then, of course, the natural way of these sites is to devolve towards this kind of mess of relationships, impossible to maintain. And even when you've been away for a few weeks, you can absolutely never fix anything in it. Of course, you can have discipline. You can be careful. You can make a sustainable jQuery site. I'm sure people have done it. But it's not the natural way of this tool. It will kind of help you make a mess and uh, of course enable you to be responsible. It's a bit like uh, an engineer deciding that every, every screw in his machine should be optimal. It should have like a, a very specific thread for each kind of holding torque it needs to have or whatever. Like uh, you get a machine where everything is optimal, but of course you also get a machine where you can use no standard screws, you have no tools, you have to make everything yourself and you have no suppliers to help you and no library of kind of uh, shared knowledge about these fasteners that you just made. So, of course, everyone goes with something like ISO 4762 and use some standard fasteners. And then you have like a world of suppliers and you have a fantastic freedom within this kind of discipline of ISO 4762 and the sizes and, and the kind of gauges they, they supply. Uh, and this is kind of, a, um, kind of a general strategy for preserving your freedom. So with great discipline it comes this great freedom. Or maybe the freedom is already given. But with the discipline, it's actually about sustaining that freedom to preserve your kind of keep your ability to have options in the future. It's about being disciplined about how you use your freedom. And of course, uh, I think everyone who's been uh, around the block in software development knows exactly that feeling. When you probably been pressured by time and you have to kind of leave your, then you know what to do, but you can't do it. And you end up making a mess, even though you know better. Um, React is a framework and we're in the age of frameworks and many of these frameworks like React have this kind of philosophy of being this groove that kind of leads you towards this pit of success. Like the easy way should be to do the right thing. So when you are pressured, when you are pressed for time, then it's easiest to do a thing that is sustainable. So it's like a, it's like a built in uh, at least like a, a goal of helping you preserve your freedom over time and helping you follow good patterns that are sustainable and kind of preserves your ability to, 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 to make new choices in the future. And your maybe machine will look more like this. And when you come back to it uh, six months later to fix something, it has clear visible patterns and you know what to do and how to fix things. And even maybe it's not even your machine and maybe you're able to, to kind of figure it out. So this is about patterns, right? So. Uh, thinking about improvisation and the kind of incredible people who are able to freestyle rap. So rap music has these kind of incredibly nested and convoluted rhyming patterns. And of course, being able to improvise in this form is about having this huge on the ready library of powerful patterns and being able to combine them in very creative ways. And even more fantastic is when you have this kind of shared pattern language, like you have a, you have a group of people who share uh, a way of thinking and a way of working, like a 
I mean, company or uh, an ecosystem around so something like like React. Uh, it enables these people to 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 act very quickly together. So so like improvisational jazz music. So this is Herbie Hancock and Miles Davis, uh, like gods of coming up with music on the spot. Um, so Herbie Hancock is a bit younger than Miles Davis, and when he applied to play in his band, he had to be on an, uh, on an audition, and he had to play for, I think, 12 hours continuously uh, through kind of a, a wire. So Miles Davis would, would or wouldn't be in the other end listening. And I think the whole point of this was for Miles Davis to be able to gauge the kind of depth of pattern languages in Herbie Hancock's mind. Is he able to go on for 12 hours without kind of getting boring? Can he kind of, uh, what, what is the depth of his kind of pattern uh, library? And then Herbie Hancock tells this story when they then kind of started playing it together uh, and he joined this band. Um, they were playing together and then probably kind of improvising uh, around some composition of Miles Davis. And then Herbie Hancock tried something and he, and he did something he deemed completely wrong. Like he played the completely insane chord. Uh, Miles Davis was able to then just find the kind of melody that would connect this insane chord to whatever they were already doing. And uh, this kind of mistake would be kind of a gift to Miles Davis uh, and allow him to get somewhere new with his improvisation. Uh, and this is possible, of course, when you have this kind of shared foundation, you have a pattern language, you know what's going on, so that this one mistake becomes just one bit of new information. You're able to deal with it on the spot in the moment and kind of improvise a new solution. So this is the power of this kind of shared established pattern language. And in jazz, this is kind of codified. It's called the real book. Uh, uh, the content is called fake sheets. So this is fake sheet music. It's like sheet music, but it's fake. So it doesn't contain the actual things you're supposed to play. It contains the rhythmic structure, the chords, and the melody. If you play literally what's on the page in a concert, you'll get booed off the stage. It's the most boring things ever. What these uh, functions are is kind of a shared library of patterns for jazz musicians. And then uh, everyone will know roughly where you are in the harmony and the kind of, kind of logic of a, of a song. And that enables everyone to, to play together and to come up with new things uh, within this kind of reacting to this kind of framework uh, and composing together in real time. So with kind of shared practices comes this ability to improvise in concert. Uh, which is a very powerful thing, for example, for a company uh, to be able to do. To be able to have the shared pattern language, first be able to have the discipline to make software that is malleable, is agile, and then to be able to have this shared understanding of how to work together and how, where you, where, where you roughly where you're going, uh, and then be able to then react to the outside signal very quickly. So kind of translated to business value, this, all this jazz stuff would be like discipline and shared practices enable sustainable agility and cohesive responsive teams. So this is the more, I guess, like businessy way of saying it, because all of this is, of course, very valuable if you're a freestyle rapper or a jazz musician or a web programmer. There's one thing missing in this picture, and that's kind of the input part of it. So this is the, the OODA loop. Uh, it's invented as kind of a way of thinking about how a fighter would control, for example, a fighter plane. So this F-5 Freedom Fighter plane is based on this uh, theory um, of how to, 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 to take in signal and then uh, orient yourself and, and make a decision and be able to act. So of course, this is kind of the missing part of this picture. So with this kind of great observation comes this great ability to, to, to um, act productively in real time. So these three things, then the freedom uh, to, to, to move and the ability to, col to collaborate in real time and then the power to observe uh, together, it, it becomes this kind of powerful way of functioning together. So uh, in the business world again, uh, powerful values. Uh, in the software world, of course, especially, I, I think nobody will kind of, uh, everyone who's worked in software knows exactly well how this is kind of applicable. Um, it is always what we are fighting, this kind of rut that keeps us from moving, the technical depth that, that kind of hold, is holding us back. 
And, and that is why we created Sanity. So initially it wasn't supposed to be a product. It was just our reaction to being feeling held back by the tools available to us. So we were creating this website uh, for the OMA. So OMA is uh, the agency of a very famous architect called Rem Koulas. They've been working since 1979, creating several seminal buildings, super important in the history of architecture. Uh, and, and creating the archive for them, we really wanted that to be like a formal structured archive, all the pieces of information, we want them encoded properly so we can visualize them like this, like a, like timelines and charts of space usage and maps and everything. Uh, and we wanted normal kind of PR people who aren't technical, who aren't librarians to be able to enter this information. So we want like an intuitive interface that helped them stay disciplined and kind of follow these uh, practices that gave us information that we could use and reuse in several ways. Because we also wanted our site to be algorithmically generated. We wanted to have a rule-based design that then could use all this information that was put in by the PR people uh, to in real time. Re so we, the, the front page is redesigned every 15 minutes uh, according to like a huge set of rules about the macro structure and the microstructure. And this is only possible because uh, we could then have these uh, people input the data in a way that we could compute and could understand as machines. And also we realized that uh, sales in the kind of, uh, if you're building huge monumental building for buildings for nation states like China, your sales isn't particularly, um, isn't specifically through your website. It's more about travel and uh, actually books. So they were always making books. So we were thinking uh, our systems should also be able to just generate books. So we made a rule-based design system together with a design company called Noda, uh, which then generated the books on demand based on whatever they wanted to show a, a customer. So we wanted this also to be able to be powered by exactly the same data with no particular specific kind of editing for these books. Uh, and then we wanted the freedom to keep moving. So this was basically the brief. And then later, of course, new things come up. So we discovered that the business development people in the company spent a lot of time just remembering the history of the company. And they had separate people who basically just were kind of archives. Um, so they could do something more productive because now we could create this very powerful search based on uh, that fact that all of the data was now codified. We knew what everything meant. This, this was like a very reasonable thing to add because we just added this interface all of the kind of expensive work was already done and also someone came up with the idea that we should have uh, to be able to find pictures from social websites based on the locations of the buildings and then kind of feed them in to the site uh, through kind of a, um, some tool where they could uh, curate them and this also sounds like an outlandish idea but because everything else was structured and sanity was kind of extensible this could be added as kind of an, an affordable cost so this kind of uh, was an example to us that uh, by, by, by building it in this manner, we retained freedom both to do all the things we wanted and then also the things we didn't know we wanted at the time of design. So, so sanity to us was about building a system that supported discipline and shared practices. And then a goal at the time was also to kind of underpin this kind of observation loop, this kind of control loop. But uh, at this time it was the schema and the structure. You can kind of carefully control what you can express, what the content can con contain, and then present a very, very intuitive user interface for the editors to then add that content and curate that content and edit that content in a form that is still um, in, within the discipline that you defined. And then structured content, which is, which is the kind of the way the content is encoded, which we can then build tooling around and, uh, and then make sure we can reuse in several ways. Um, and then uh, now we are getting to the point where we add the observation part. So here is an example where we integrate Google Analytics data in the middle of the CMS. So here you can see the performance of your content. Uh, and you can also see it kind of interspersed with data from the CMS telling you when you published new versions. You can go back in history and see the different versions and see how they performed. And maybe form some kind of theories about, about, about the reasoning uh, for how this performance changes. So this is a one thing very literal example of feedback of course a uh, very other very typical example is being able to have previews so here is gatsby preview embedded inside the uh, sanity so you can see in real time exactly how your data looks in the website so this is of course very obvious and of course useful 
But we are also really, really scared of that in Sanity because we feel that having one preview, it, it kind of endangers, like, it puts you in danger of over-optimizing your content for one specific representation. And this, in, even if you're, all of your technology is kind of supporting this um, discipline and freedom and whatever, this can kind of hold you back because now you made all of your content for this specific uh, view. And maybe you need it in a new way or you came up with a better way of displaying it or you have a um, time has passed and you want to redesign the, present, the kind of framing. And now you're stuck. You have to go back and do all your content again. So um, we uh, designed previews so that you get several previews. So this is an example of a different preview in the same kind of framework where you uh, simulate different kind of kinds of color vision. So color blindness. Is, um, uh, and now you can kind of uh, very quickly uh, get the gauge on how your content will look to different people and if it's readable uh, to everyone. Um, and also, of course, this is uh, an interesting way to, uh, to think about it. Or for when you're authoring for voice interfaces, like me, face with open eyes and mouth with head exploding. So this is, of course, a preview showing you how your content will uh, work for a screen reader. And maybe you wouldn't use so many emojis in your core content then. Uh, and this, for example, maybe you should also consider how your content looks in print. Uh, so this kind of multitude of previews in real life preview, for example, it will just kind of help your editors think principled about the content and, 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 and never kind of consider it like ne never optimizing like the length of a word for a specific like breakpoint or whatever, because uh, you will be reminded that uh, this will go through a multitude of representations. Uh, and the way you then edit the content, the, the content of the discipline the structure will then also be malleable and will be part of what preserves your freedom. So our dream is to be a framework for kind of responsible improvisation. And the whole kind of Jamstack serverless feel to us is a kind of heroic attempt to create this kind of system for freedom. Uh, and that's at least the kind of a uh, hair, big hairy goal of all this is kind of is, is empowering individuals and, and groups to be able to do things that used to uh, used to require huge resources and stay nimble and quick and be able to improvise and react to the world in real time. So that's my talk. Thank you.